So let's just, let's hop into the word that way. We got, we're in 2 Timothy, and we're going to be talking about empowerment. And so where do we get this power? Where does this, this sort of thing come from? And um, just to kind of catch you up, if you're new here, uh, my name is Casey. I get to serve as one of the pastors, and this here is the Avenue Church. We're so excited to be, um, we're not guests, we're like family with Trinity. And Trinity's worshiping right now, and we're worshiping right now, and, and we're doing this whole church united thing, and it's like really beautiful um, because Jesus, it, it's like his dream for the church that we would learn how to live like family, and by so doing, the world would get really curious about things they've never been curious about before, namely Jesus. And so we're super excited to be here. And we, we've been walking through this vision. It's a two-year vision called Vision 2020, Expect Greater Things. And it comes from this radical promise that Jesus has for us that we're going to do the same great works that he did and even greater works than he did because he's going to the Father. And what that means is he's going to fill us believers with his Holy Spirit to go out and, and see the gospel message of faith and repentance leading to life in Christ. It's, we're going we're to see that go out in far greater measure than he ever saw it during his three years. The priesthood of believers, us, we are going to actually be empowered to go do these greater works of seeing the dead raised to life. Uh, and Jesus is going to be with us through his Holy Spirit to do that. And we've been talking here, what does that look like? Well, it's a 3 to 6%. Uh, in the Church United movement, there are several churches who are believing for, for, for 6%. Right now, there's a 3% identified um, born-again Christian. Like, hey, and th there's a couple of questions that, that, are, that are identifying, like Jesus is the only way, inerrancy of the Word of God, a couple things. And so after a survey went out, it came back that in the South Florida area, 3% identified as, as Jesus followers. And we're just saying, man, well, let's double that. What would it be like to double the amount of Christ followers? And they have a five-year goal. We just shrunk it down to two. What would it be like to see um, us in our particular area, like, baptize twice as many people as we ever have before? And so we've been just, like, asking God for that and working towards that and believing his spirit is going to give us that. And, and uh, it's been really awesome. And so in the midst of that vision, we said, hey, we have to shift the culture. And there's a few shifts that need to happen. The shift that we're focusing on right now is all about empowerment, making this shift from ownership to empowerment. For, for the tradition of our church, eight years in, we've been really good about owning particular areas of ministry. Like if this is what I do, I, I own it really well. I'm really committed to it. But the shift that we need to make is from me just owning it to me actually giving it away so that others can flourish in the same area. So, so it's, it's this idea of like multiplying um, the effort. And we, we're, we're defining um, this word that leads to empowerment of others that leads to disciples making disciples that make disciples and and sort of the key to that we're saying is this idea of empowerment and so we wanted to define empowerment and this is how we define empowerment from Cambridge um, the Cambridge dictionary the process of gaining freedom and power to do what you want you are empowered when that is true of you now we always caveat this anytime I say something that might be like well what do you mean do what I want that sounds like so self-serving well, let me, let me just kind of explain to you what that means. See, when a person comes to faith in Christ, when we start to see the 3% move to 4% and then 5% and, and we're like baptizing 17 people like we did two weeks ago, which was amazing. I mean, like when we're starting to see the vision happen, Jesus' vision, not ours, we're just joining him. What happens is you start to, to meet people who want different things than they wanted three, four years ago. Do you understand what I'm saying? Like, like when I was over here outside of Christ, I wanted a whole different set of things than I do inside of Christ because the Holy Spirit has come to live within me and I have these new desires and, and these new appetites. And so the key to empowerment, the key to discipleship is actually being able to work with others to give them freedom and power to now do what they actually want to do under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Okay, and so that's, that's what we're doing. It's like freedom and power. Well, how do you get there? And we're, we're exploring that through a verse-by-verse -verse study of, of 2 Timothy. And so uh, if you have your Bibles, that's where we're going to be. And this is section three of that study, so I encourage you to, to hop on. Um, if you've, if, if you, this is a, a sort of a first time for you, you might, you might uh, want to play catch up. And if not, that's totally cool too. The idea here is this. The idea here is this, and this is what's been, been leading our time. When we think of discipleship, 
And when we think of empowering others to be a part of this vision where, where they not only understand the life-changing message of Jesus, but they are then equipped to give it away and give it away and give it away, it, it sort of changes what you're after. You're no longer after safe, compliant, and comfortable people who, who know how to love Jesus in the, in the safety of their home. You're actually moving towards creating another generation of believers that are becoming vastly disruptive. We believe that Jesus was the most disruptive character in all of history. Like, he just disrupted all sorts of systems that were ungodly. And if we are going to empower other people to then give this message of Jesus and his gospel away, we, we can't just shoot for people who follow the rules. We have to shoot for people who, under the power and the goodness of the Holy Spirit, see what needs to be disrupted in here and out there and move toward it. And move toward it. It was very disruptive to open our home to two new kids. It actually disrupted everything. And yet the gospel is exploding in our home like it never has before. Second Timothy, uh, beginning in, in chapter 1. This is a letter from Paul writing to Timothy. Paul's the older brother who is, he, he's, he's, and not, I don't mean that in a bad way for those of you who know that's a kind of not a great connotation. He's the one who's poured into Timothy for years and now he's, he's continuing the empowerment process. And what we're going to do is we're going to learn what that means for us in this context. Beginning in verse 1. You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. First stop. Um, when we talk about being strengthened, we have to understand there's a couple ways you can be strengthened and motivated, if you will. So he starts off this, this particular section of the letter talking to his child. He, there, um, week one, we talked about the affection. Like if we're going to empower other people, now I need you to, to stay with me here. We're looking at this through a lens of what does it mean for me to pour into somebody else? How do I pour the gospel into somebody else? What does that look like? So for you, if you understand the gospel, that's the lens you're looking at this from. If you're new to the gospel or you don't understand the gospel, you're going to look at this letter from a different lens, from the Timothy lens. You're like the one who's like, man, I need somebody who's going to treat me like an affectionate child. I need somebody who's going to embrace me and walk alongside of me as I grow up in the faith. So you can, you can approach this from two different ways. You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Okay, our first stop here is where are we going to be motivated for this? How are we going to empower people? Well, first of all, you're going to need strength because it's going to be super exhausting. If we're going to be disruptive and we're going to teach other people to be disruptive for the gospel and to think outside the box and to take Jesus where Jesus has never gone before, we are going to need strength for that journey. Now, there's a couple of places you can get strength. You can get motivation. You can, you can be motivated or you can be strengthened by fear. And for a while, I can get my kids to do what I want them to do out of fear of daddy. But you know what happens if we raise children that I'm trying to, so I'm, I'm applying all this in my home, by the way, I'm trying to. Okay, so if, you're, if, if this is kind of like, man, where do, where do I first like, kind of try to plug and play this? Start in your home, parents. This is, this is how we raise our children in the gospel. So, so I can, I can like, hang out with my kids, and I can motivate them or strengthen them by fear. That's an option. But what happens is when we use fear as a motivator, and we use, um, well, I'll just, I'll just stick with fear for a second. But usually what happens is you can get compliance, but you don't get disruptive kids when it matters. You can get compliance for the 18 years they are there because they're afraid of what will happen to them. But as soon as they bounce out of that home, many of you can attest to this because this is the home you grew up in, they become disruptive, but they, they become disruptive in a bad way. So they're, they're unfortunately compliant to your fear. You didn't touch their heart. And so, and so when they leave, they become disruptive, but they become disruptive and they do what they want, but what they want is not good and, and holy and, and godly. You can strengthen and you can motivate children and people you pour into and sponsees and all those sorts. You can motivate them through fear. You can also motivate them through guilt. Guilt's a really good motivator, like for a minute right? Like, I, I can probably get you to do what I want by guilting you in to, like, the crisis of foster care. And if you, if you move into, whether it's foster care or whether it's racial reconciliation or whether it's human trafficking or anything that God has called us to disrupt and not be cool with, at least during our watch, 
during my however many years I get, I can't be cool with, with the different injustices that are going on around me. I'm supposed to disrupt those. I could probably get some of you to come with me out of guilt. That's just not an awesome way to live. And you're going you're gonna to bounce out after a good minute or so. Because the guilt is going to motivate you for a little bit, just kind of like the fear did. But that's going to wear off because guilt doesn't get to your heart, nor does fear. But grace, grace gets to your heart. When you don't have to, but you start to have the power and the freedom to want to, now we're starting to talk about somebody who gets disruptive and starts getting after the whole Jesus thing. This is what Paul is telling Timothy. Don't be strengthened by works. Don't be strengthened because you have to do this ministry. Don't be strengthened because you have to open your homes to foster care. Don't be strengthened because you should care about the homeless. Be strengthened, pour into other people because you don't have to and the Father's affection will never change for you whether you do or whether you don't. You don't have to earn your Father's affection. Jesus already earned it for you, gives it to you, and now you can actually move forward because you're enjoying his affection, because you have a growing loyalty to this father, not because you're trying to keep or earn something from this father. That's a different type of motivation. When I was about 17 years old, I think I was a senior in high school, um, I, there, was, there was somebody that I was very close to, and it was a class trip that went on a cruise. I was a, I was a senior, and she was a, a, a junior. And so a, cla a class full of juniors on a cruise is not a good combination, right? Like you can just imagine it's not, it's not like a recipe for awesomeness. So anyways, on awesome things happened on the cruise. And it was a school cruise. So you're also thinking, what? that's probably bad idea number two. Anyways, <laughs> they came back, and so because it was a school cruise, like school consequences applied to the unawesome things they were doing on the cruise. And I remember her parents said something to the effect of this. Um, like, uh, I don't remember the word. I, I can barely remember, like, Tuesday of this week. But it went something like this, okay? Um, like, we're really embarrassed by how you acted. Like, you embarrassed us. Your actions embarrassed us. And, and I can remember my dad. I, if anybody knows my dad, he's, a, he's like a big dude. And his voice is, and his presence is actually bigger than he is. I mean, to, to me, my dad's like, like, like eight foot eight and about, I don't know, like 350, but not in a bad way. Like it, like it fits his frame. It's, he's just kind of like a good Goliath. And, um, and so when he speaks, man, his words, I can remember, I can't remember Tuesday, but I can remember things that he's told me. And one of the things I remember he told me, because it was always important to be a Cleveland. It always meant something when you carried the family name. Like, that was a big deal, and we acted and behaved, and we were a certain way, and when, when we were out of line, we knew about it. But I can remember, for some reason, he stepped in the gap all on his own because we were talking about, we used to talk about things like this as a family. He stepped in the gap, and he said something to the effect of this. Listen, there is nothing that you could ever do that would make me be embarrassed to be your dad. I was like, Dang, like you're telling me that? Like, like I, I, it just blew me away that he was giving me this freedom of affection outside of my performance. There's nothing that you could ever do that would compromise me coming along and saying, that's my son and I love him and I'm proud of him and I'm with him. Do you understand the loyalty that that breeds in my heart? toward that man? Do you have any idea of what I would do for that man? Not because I have to, but because he strengthened me with grace. Some of you just need to hear from your heavenly father. In Christ, he will never be embarrassed. There is nothing you could do that would make him say, that child is not mine. I love them, I'm proud of them, and I am for them at all times. That's what the message of Christ does for us in the gospel. Be strengthened by that grace. 
and what you have heard from me in the, in, in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others. Stop. I had, a, I had a dear friend of mine this week tell me, I think we're missing this generation when it comes to discipleship. I, I, I think that we are doing a pretty good job of like passing the gospel along to, to, like from here to here. But he was reading this book called Eats with Sinners, and, and he said he was, he was affected by this idea of discipleship is not just what you pass on to this person. It's what you pass on to this person so that they can pass it on to this person and this person and this person. It's the difference between addition, multiplication, and actually exponential growth. The gospel was, was not actually meant to just go like one at a time. Like, like I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share the gospel with you, and I'm going to hope that you come to faith in Christ, and then I'm good. The gospel goes like this. I'm going to share that same love of the Father that's only available to you in Christ, but is available to you at any time, moment, and season of your life. So come and receive it now. If you've never received it, that's a lifetime invitation. I'm not just saying that. Some of you needed to hear that. I don't always invite you to it. Sometimes I just tell you about it. Just come and receive Christ. I'm going to give you an opportunity at the end when we have communion. You need to come forward and be prayed over and receive Christ. So, so it's not only to, to help somebody receive Christ, it's actually to help them receive Christ so that they are free and empowered to help other people to receive Christ. It's like I sponsor you, not just so that you get sober, but you actually keep your sobriety by giving it away. And we need to start to change our definition of what empowerment means, or at least what discipleship means. This is true empowerment. Look, this is what Paul is telling Timothy. He's like, I need you to give away what I've told you to, to other faithful men, women, whoever it is, so that they will teach others. That's the idea behind it. Not just so that they'll grow holy. Not just so that they'll like, get, like, quit watching porn and quit cussing. Like, that's not the goal of empowerment and discipleship. Like, like it's it, great that God continues to make you holier and holier and more and more like him. It's part of it. It's just not the period in the middle of the sentence. The reason that you become holier and holier is because you fall more in love with Jesus and you become more like him who always thought about giving it away. So we have this, this, this big concept here. I'm going to empower you, Timothy, so that you empower others, so that they empower others. And we start to see the gospel move forward exponentially, and we start to see things like 3% not move to 4%, but move to 6%. And then when the 6%, we get there, and we want to double that, and then it goes to 12%, and then it goes to 24%. And then maybe Jesus comes back, and it's just super awesome. And then, we don't, then there's no percent. It's just like, what's up? We're just going to It's just worship. The, the band just keeps playing. You know, it's like, Yes. All right, let's keep going. Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. I'm going to do this section all together. So next one. An athlete is, remember soldier, an athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. It is the hardworking farmer who ought to have the first share of the crop. Stop. Okay, so we've got soldier, we've got athlete, and what's this one we got? Great. Awesome. So here's the deal. Um, we're going to come back to that in just a minute because we've got a kind of special way we're going to end today. I just want to point out, because you can read, right? You can, you can read this, and this preaches itself. I'm just trying not to mess it up, okay? Um, so you, you can read these, these sort of things, and, and I love reading them, and I love the insight that I feel like the Lord like, gets to share into my heart, and I get to share to you, and so, you know, it's, it's not just quite a not, not mess it up, but it's, it's like, man, this just preaches beautifully. The only thing I want to say is there's, is, is what this is not, and then we're going to keep going. He calls Timothy, and those of us who will pursue empowering others, he calls us three things. He calls us to be soldiers, not students. It was interesting. I was thinking through, like, Lord, what do you want to do with those three words? Soldiers, athletes, and farmers. And he gave me a, a, a word that starts with the same letter that each of them do, but he gave it to me, like, in the way of, like, this is what I'm not calling you to be. But I think sometimes this is what, like, the, the church, quote-unquote, makes us or invites us to be. 
And so we're soldiers, not students. Now that doesn't mean that there's not learning involved. It doesn't mean that knowledge isn't huge. It doesn't mean that studying your word, going to Bible study, being in groups is important. Because if I'm a soldier but I don't know who I'm fighting or how to fight, I'm gonna get what? Uh, okay, let's try this again. So I'm a soldier, I'm out there, it's super dangerous, I don't know how to fire my thing, I don't even know who to point my thing. After a while, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get killed, and I'm gonna get those people around me. It's gonna be bad news bears all over, right? <laughs> bad. I'm gonna get hurt, and other people are gonna get hurt. So, so learning and being a student, being a lifelong learner is part of being a disciple. It's just that when we actually get into the doing of our Christian faith, which is large part about giving it away to others. The call is not to be a professional student who sits in the comfort of the classroom and takes in at his or her pleasure and maybe does what they want with the information at some particular time. The call is to be a soldier. And as you know, soldiers bleed, they sweat, they die, they leave good things behind for better. The call is to be an athlete, not an attender. I think sometimes in the, again, quote unquote, the church, we're not, we're, we, we prop up students like, wow, this is awesome because th this person, he or she has so much learning. I want to prop up soldiers. I feel like the Lord was telling me to tell my kids and to tell you guys, I was thinking about my, my wife the other day, and I'm like, man, you know what I did is I married a warrior. And I want my son and my daughter to go out and find other warriors who are not afraid to sweat, bleed, and die. We're not just soldiers, but we're also athletes. And when it comes to athletes, uh, the difference here was like, it's, we're not called to be attenders, we're called to be athletes. And you know what an athlete does? One of the things that defines an athlete is an athlete, it's, in this passage it says, knows the rules and then plays to win, basically plays to win. And in order for you to know the rules and to play to win, you're going to have to probably what? Now, this is not obvious, so, so work with me. You're going to probably have to what? Train. We're like locked in, Matt. This is awesome. <laughs> this is great. This is super good. Train. You don't have to train at all to attend this church. You come and sit. You can sit here in the more comfy seats. You can sit in the uncomfortable bleachers. I know. I understand. I get it. You guys are suffering a little bit. It's cool. I, it seems like sometimes the church um, is cool with you guys attending. We're actually like, wow, numbers were awesome. Why? Got any new foster care homes? Got any new kids, kingdom kids, volunteers? You got anybody going out and, and working with uh, kids in, in schools where nobody has enough food to eat? Uh, you got anybody working towards um, the whole like gentrification issue and what are we doing here in Delray as this moves? What about the people who were there? And then what, You got anybody doing anything? No, but we increased our attendance by like 10%. Like, so? Listen, I'm not talking, and by the way, I'm not talking about out there. Like, I'm talking about what goes on in my heart. Like, this isn't just like, oh, some other pastors who aren't as, like, gospel-centered as me. This is me, like, that has to fight this battle. Athletes, not attenders. And then he says farmers, not feeders. Farmers, not feeders. Now, I don't, I don't know about farmers. Uh, <laughs> I was, my wife and I went on, a, we went on a date last night with Sam and his wife, our youth pastor. He's going to be speaking here in just a little bit, and um, a couple weeks. And, and I, we drove by some fields. We went out to Delray Marketplace. And do you know there's fields in Delray? Like, I, it's kind of, I forget that. I just think it's all, like, coffee shops and places that I want to be. But there's actually fields <laughs> out in West Delray. And I drove by the fields, and I said, babe, do you think I'd make a good farmer? And what did you say? No. <laughs> no. I'm like, but I get up early. You know, like... I, there's, there's not a ton of people out there, and I'm not, I'm not really fully a people person. Like, I don't know if you, if you know me, you know that, like, I'm, I'm refreshed kind of, like, in my, over here. <laughs> you know, and, and so, like, the farmer can maybe do that. And so I was thinking maybe, you know, if a farmer, and she's like, no. Here's, here's the thing about a farmer. A farmer, you rarely hear about a farmer who's overly obsessed about how well he or she's eating. The farmer's business is to feed others. Farmer's like, how, 
How's the crop so that it can go out there? Because I know if it doesn't go out there, people are going to get hungry and starve and die. Does the farmer eat? Of course the farmer eats. Is it important that the farmer gets fed to sustain and to flourish? Absolutely. But the farmer's main goal isn't how big he can get his or her belly. The farmer is actually in usually pretty good shape because they're working so hard so that other people can eat. If we're going to be a culture of empowerment, these are things that have to be more and more true about us than they've ever been in the past. Like me, me like with you. All right, let's finish the passage and then we'll, we'll shift here. Next, next verse, please. Think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. I love that. I, I could preach that and just be like, here's the passage, think it over. God's got it. <laughs> I love how Paul says that. He doesn't have to explain everything. That's really cool. When you're empowering somebody else, you don't have to explain everything. Sometimes the Lord's just going to explain it in due time. Okay, next. Remember Jesus Christ. You could almost just preach that every week, which I try to do. And, and like, it would just be so good. This is where I got to the passage, and I, 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 my Bible, man, is, is just, like, written up. It's torn up. I just love, like, to get in there, and I'm, like, one with the Word. And, and I got to this part of the passage, and I couldn't, it was like I couldn't touch it. It was like, man, I was on some ground, and I was like, oh, my goodness. Just let me read this to you. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel which I'm suffering bound with chains as a criminal, but the word of God is not bound. Here's what he brings Timothy back to, because, you know, Timothy's going to suffer. In order to empower people, it's going to require suffering. It's going to, you're being invited into killing the monster of comfort that we all have, some bigger than others, and there's going to be suffering involved in that, and you're going to lose things along the way. Your heart is going to be broken along the way. If your heart hasn't been broken this side of heaven because you poured into somebody, and they, like, fill in the blank. They relapsed. They went that way. They had an affair. They talked poor about you. They, they left this fellowship and they talked bad. Whatever the case may be, if you haven't like had your heart broken for somebody who's kind of like walked away from the faith, like keep going because it's, go it's gonna happen. There's suffering that's going to be involved when we start mingling our lives with other people and trying to pour in the person of Christ. And here's what he tells Timothy. As that's happening, this is where, remember he starts by being strengthened by what? grace. He goes in here, remember Jesus Christ. Hey, remember Jesus Christ. Don't forget Jesus Christ. Remember Jesus Christ. This is where the power is, people. The power is in Christ, not Christ the martyr. What kind of Christ? Listen, you may have heard that Jesus died for your sins, and that is 100% true. The wrath of God that should have gone to Pete Corwin, as awesome and nice as he is, you're going to see Pete in just a minute up on this stage, because we're going to end it in a really cool way. He, he's super awesome guy. But, but he was born into this world in sin, and he got really good at sin. And, and the father, because he's holy and just, had to bring a, a wrath toward Pete Corwin and, and had to separate himself from Pete. And the penalty that Pete deserved was hell, eternal separation from a holy and just God because of the sinfulness and selfishness and brokenness of his heart. Remember, I love Pete. But Christ died for Pete. And he took his place, and he took his sin and his selfishness and suffering and his lustful and all the things that, that, that used to define Pete and, and still sometimes call his name. And, and Christ stood in Pete's place, and he's like, I know what you need to do to Pete, Father, but you got to do it to me. And the Father poured out the wrath with Pete's name that Pete deserved onto Jesus fully. He was satisfied with how he emptied the wrath that was deserving for Pete to go out to Christ. And Christ died in Pete's place but he didn't stay dead, or that would be a horror. That would be not good news. That would just be more bad news. Another person dying along the way. Jesus rose from the dead. He, he is risen from the dead. And what that means is he defeated Pete's sin. He paid the price and then came back and overcame the penalty that was due Pete so that Pete, when he trusted in that sacrifice for himself, when he gave his life over to the resurrected Christ, could be forgiven of his sin could be empowered to be a new person who's no longer defined by those things, could be risen up in the local church to empower other people. The same Pete Corwin that was absolutely dead in his sin is now going to be a pastoral figure at this church. How did that happen? 
I'm gonna tell you why. It wasn't from Bible studies. It wasn't from awesome people pouring in them. All those things were important. It happened because there was a man named Jesus who got up from the dead. You've got to remember that, Pete Corwin. You've got to remember that, Steve Bakosha. You've got to remember that, Mitch Thompson. No matter who you are and where you've walked, you've got to remember that. This is our story. This is our power. The offspring of David preached in my gospel. Let's finish the passage. Therefore, I endure everything. Therefore, I endure everything. I, I, can't, I don't have a tele... This isn't a teleprompter. It'd be cool if I was like, you know, on the halftime of the NBA analyst. Uh, now nah, I'd, I'd break it out, you know, like I'd be like, this is what I do. And I'd circle it and I'd hop into the screen and I'd do something to like hug it and let you know that this is the part that you got to remember right now as it comes to empowerment. This is going to take endurance. This is not for the faint of heart. Everything for the sake of the elect that they also may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Keep going, please. The saying is trustworthy. For if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. For he cannot deny himself. What are the elements today? What are the elements today of this idea of exponential growth? I have this, um, it, I don't know if it's a weird slide to you or not. Could you put that thing up with the symbols? Yeah. Um, and, and so here's the idea is that, that multiplication is greater than addition when it comes to gospel ministry. You sharing the gospel with somebody and seeing their life transform is awesome. But you know what's awesome er? I don't know, it's a word or not. <laughs> you pouring into somebody and seeing their life transform, and part of that transformation is equipping them to then go out and give it to three or four other people, who then go out and give it to three or four other people. And so what my good friend Rob told me, that's his name, who, who it was, by the way, this week, what my good friend Rob told me was, it's actually not just multiplication, Casey, it's exponential growth. I mean, if you're going to see the three go to six, go to 12, and then at some point Jesus comes back. All right, so what are, what are some of the elements of that? Make it about Jesus. Make it about Jesus. It's always got to be about Jesus, guys. It, it can never be about, like, the next study. That's super cool. I don't know what happened with the lights. That was awesome, right? It kind of got dim. Does that mean I got to go? I got, like, a couple minutes. I'm almost done. Make it about Jesus. Don't forget Jesus. Remember Jesus. Be strengthened by grace. Make it about Jesus always, every morning. You know what I'm my most disruptive is when I just have this mental picture of me getting behind Jesus and outside of my like selfish anxiousness and just being like, all right, let's go. Let's go. If you're here and you battle anxiety all day, every day, and it's that constant darkness that you have to like stiff arm, we're friends, okay? Just so you know. Your pastor, that's, that's like my MO, has been for years. Maybe God is just going to completely remove it, or maybe he's going to help to, to like get me better at just let's go doing this. Make it about Jesus for the people you're empowering. Make it about Jesus so that they make it about Jesus. What else? Next one. Catch, oh, start bigger. Yeah, start bigger. We, we went over this. It's not just about seeing somebody grow in their faith. It's about seeing somebody grow in their faith so that others can grow with them. You know, if you train people to just get holier and better at loving Jesus without training them to give it away, you haven't really done well. If I train my kids to simply just, like, be good Christian kids, whatever, whatever that means, be marryable and hireable and they leave the house, dude, like, I, I, will, I will think I failed. I want them to be marriable. I want them to get a job someday. I want them, you know, like, like, I get it. Like, I want them to partake in those things if God wills it and designs it and things like that. But I want them to understand that they are an arrow in the quiver that is going to be shot out to be radically disruptive, not just to hit one thing, because sometimes arrows hit one thing and they destroy that one thing. And sometimes arrows hit a target that break open a whole new world. That's what I want for my kids. That's what I want for this church. 
that's what we need to start wanting for the people we're pouring into. Here's what you do, according to this passage. You catch the faithful, you see who's out there being faithful, you entrust the faithful, you, you train them, and you send them. I'm going to ask um, the elders who uh, are coming forward today, so that's Pete, and I already talked about you, Pete, so you, you better come now. Bob. Um, not sure if Joe Sharp is here or if he's with the kids. You know about Joe? With the kids? Okay, cool. So this is where we're going to end. I'm just going to ask you guys to stand here for a minute. and um, I'm calling this a word to the AC. A word to the AC. And um, this is for all of us, but this is specifically for them. So, so this church, uh, we believe... We looked at the New Testament, and we, we see how churches are set up, and they're set up in a, such a way that there's what's called a plurality of elders, which means that there's a group of elders that help to shepherd the church, that help to lead the church, so that it's not just, like, one person and, and like, one personality. It's, it's plurality, because God always does his best work in community. And so uh, Mitch and Kyle are current elders with me uh, right now, and um, we are actually bringing on and today ordaining um, three new elders. Joe Sharp, who's being disruptive with my little kids today and Kingdom Kids. Uh, Pete Corwin, who you heard, you heard his whole life story today, okay? Um, so you know him very well. And Bob Lelaine. Um, and So can we just give them a hand today? <laughs> I'm going to ask our, our team to come up because we're going to, from, from this moment of, of ordination, we're going to uh, then, then move into communion and, uh, and celebrate the Lord's Supper together. And they're going to actually be the ones to serve you that. Um, and, and so these, these are men that have been caught being faithful. They've been entrusted with the Word of God, and now they're being sent as, as your elders to serve um, this local church. There's, there's been a time of open discussion about that and, and, and uh, where you guys were able to partake in anything that may prevent them uh, from that, and that, that time has come to a close, and we, we are excited to affirm uh, their eldership. Another word for elder is pastor. Another word is shepherd. And So um, when you hear me say I'm one of the pastors, you know it's not just me. We have, we have several pastors here who have capable hands. And I want to speak to you guys today very briefly and charge you as I charge everyone else in here. And there's, there's three things that I feel like the Lord wants you to hear from this passage, and, and they're this. The first one is this. Be willing to lose for the greater win. Be willing to lose for the greater win. You know, that's what a soldier signs up for, right? Soldiers suffer. And from day one, they're willing to lose for the greater win. So I'm calling you guys to that and trusting you with that. I'm sending you forward with that, that idea that it, it, as we step into this role together, that we would constantly be willing to lose for the greater win, just like Christ lost, but really won. Secondly, be willing to compete for the greater win. So the first metaphor was of a soldier who would be willing to suffer for the greater win. The second metaphor is of an athlete who knows the rules and would obviously need to train if he were going to win. And so not, not only be willing to lose for the greater win, but be willing to compete for the greater win and understand that the win is not multiplication. The win is not addition. The win is not your own personal sanctification. The win is when we see 3% go to 6%, go to 12%, and we begin to pour into the AC family in such a way that they are then equipped to give it away. That is the win. And then finally, be willing to endure for the greater win. So you have a soldier that suffers, you have an athlete that competes and that trains, and then you have this farmer. And man, the thing about a farmer is they just work super long hours that nobody sees, but everybody benefits from. Be willing to endure. Go ahead and take a look out here. Be willing to endure for our family, who will need you to slowly and gently remind them of that Father's love 
that there will never be a day that the Father is not for them in Christ, in Christ alone. And so as we uh, prepare our hearts to take communion, uh, I'm going to ask you to, to kneel, please. We're going to lay hands on you as the scriptures give us pictures of the New Testament. And uh, this is a moment where we believe that um, as we lay hands on these men, faithful men, um, that the Holy Spirit is actually laying his presence upon them and empowering them to actually serve and lead the same way we just described. Father, we ask that you would fill Pete, Bob, and Joe with your Holy Spirit and that from this point on, you would commission them and confirm them in the gospel ministry of being a shepherd and a pastor and an elder here at the Avenue Church. May they never tire of being disruptive and disrupting those around them. Father, we love you and we sing your praise because of men like this and the work you've done in their lives. In Christ's name, amen. Now, as they rise, I'm going to ask them one question, and then we're going to be released to the tables. Here's the question. Do you affirm and agree to all that was spoken today about both the gospel and the gospel call that you have on your life to serve as an elder? Do you? So would you guys please take your spots at the tables, and the tables are uh, communion tables. You'll, you'll find bread and uh, juice that reminds us of the, the body and blood of Christ that was broken for us. The tables are open to anyone who confesses Christ as Lord and Savior. Um, they're also open for us to uh, examine ourselves and uh, come forward. Uh, if, if there might be a place in your life where you've maybe made peace with sin and you need to, you need to like settle that with God, um, this is an open invitation to actually not come to the table, but to, but to do business with God, to come to a place where you're like, you know what, Lord, I don't want to live outside of your design anymore. It's a, it's a, it's a time for you to, to take a moment and examine yourself, be like, Lord, I'm not where you want me to be, and I know how, I'm, I'm just not ready to make those changes. The scripture says examine yourself and then, and then ask the Lord to like basically change your heart before you come and just make a mockery of the Lord's sacrifice for you. And so I would encourage you to do that if that's you. We're gonna have prayer partners up here during communion as well. Um, so prayer partners, if you come forward and make sure that you get communion, but also be available to pray for people who may wanna receive Christ, people who, who may uh, need, need to confess sin and ask for forgiveness, not from you, but they may need somebody to, to help them to understand who the Father is and his graciousness toward them. This is also a moment for for those of you who are just like, man, I'm, I understand my brokenness, my sinfulness. And you know, Lord, like you're my treasure. And I know I'm, I'm, I'm messy, but you're all I got. You're the best I got. And I'm coming to you to feed me and nourish me and remind me of who I am. So if that's you, we would, we would tell you now that the tables are open. There's one here and, and then two in the back. So come partake of the elements and then we'll, we'll all actually take them together in just a moment. So the scriptures say that uh, in the night that Jesus was betrayed, took bread and he broke it. And he said, this body is going to be broken. Um, and so when you take it, uh, do it in remembrance of me. And then Paul further explains in the New Testament that it's not just remembering that Christ was broken, it's also looking forward to him coming back to restore all things. And so take eat in that fashion. On that same night, he took the cup. And he said, this is, this is going to remind you of my blood that's going to be poured out for the forgiveness of your sin. Take and drink. So we do the same. You see a few people up here who are willing to pray with you. Um, believing that a couple of things were supposed to happen today. just felt like the Lord was sharing with my heart that uh, there was going to be uh, quite a few people that came to know Christ, not just in this church, but in the church here in our area. Like Acts 2 type, like God was just going to compel people to come in. Um, so believe him for that. So if you, if you 
want to trust Christ as your Savior and you want a little bit more, like, what does that mean? What's, how do I do that? There's people up here that would love to walk you through that. We also thought that there was going to be healing today. So if, if you have something that uh, has been just with you, it's been owning you, it's a physical ailment, a, a mental illness, whatever the case may be, we're actually believing for healing, that the Holy Spirit still heals and loves to do that. And uh, so if you need healing of any kind, come and, and be prayed over. And we'll ask the Lord to, to heal you as well. Deliverance, reconciliation, or family. All the things that were part of the early church. So we're going to have our prayer partners stay up here for a while and be able to do that for you guys. And um, I'm going to give an official uh, benediction right now. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. And may he make his face to shine upon you and give you his peace in Christ. Amen and amen.